everybody. Welcome back to the Lab 207 webcast. I'm Mr. K. I'll be your instructor for the day. Today we continue on in our series on cells with the nucleus in the endomembrane system. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. Today we got a bunch of stuff to cover, so we might be a little longer than our normal 10 minutes. In the last video, I made some lame joke about objectives falling from the top, then they caught on fire. Thanks, Keynote, for sweet transitions, but this time coming down from the top. There is just one. It is to describe the structure and functions of the nucleus, the ribosomes, and the organelles of the endomembrane system. Now, structure and function is going to be a big part of this discussion, so try to keep an eye or an ear on that as we talk through it. We're going to start out with the nucleus, which I'm sure from your basic bio class you probably remember is like the brain of the cell. Before we start talking about its many functions, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about its structure, because a unique structure helps it to do what it does. First thing to note are the basic parts of it. You have got the nucleolus, which we will talk about in just a second. You have got the nucleus itself, or the inner nucleus, where all the genetic material hangs out. I'm not going to draw around it, but you have got the nuclear envelope that surrounds it. Structurally, the thing I want you to remember about the nuclear envelope is that it is a double bilayer. So that means that there are two membranes each of those membranes are a phospholipid bilayer, and that surrounds the nucleus and keeps it all together. Lining the inside of that nuclear envelope is the nuclear lamina. It's essentially a network of fibers that helps to give the nucleus shape. In the middle, the nucleolus, that is a dense set of genetic material that has the sole purpose of manufacturing rRNA, which is a component in ribosomes. Nucleus would be useless if things could not get in and out of it. So around the outside of it, you'll see all of these nuclear pores. We got a really sweet micrograph of them right here. Each nucleop nuclear pore has got a protein complex around the outside of it that opens it and closes it to let things go inside and out. Last thing that I want you to note about the nucleus is that its outer membrane, remember I said it has two membranes, is continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum. Right there is an example of that. And we'll talk about why that's important in just a moment. But first, let's talk about the major functions of the nucleus. The first one is that it contains most genetic information. Now note I said most, not all. In a later video, we're going to talk about chloroplasts and mitochondria. They've got their own genetic information. The other big thing it does, other than holding all the information that keeps you alive, is the nucleolus makes ribosomal subunits, which will become ribosomes later on and without ribosomes nothing would be able to get done within the cell so let's step on a little bit and talk about those ribosomes a couple things to note about them is their big job is they are protein factories in the picture here you will see that they are made up of a large subunit and a small subunit this red thing in the middle is like an entry point where mRNA strings right through the middle of this thing so without these reading strings of mRNA, we would not have proteins that do most of the work in our body. So remember those things about a ribosome, and also remember that locationally they are manufactured in the nucleolus. Also know that there are two types. You've got free ribosomes and you've got bound ribosomes. When we talk about our endoplasmic reticulum in a second, that'll become more clear, but right now I just want you to realize that some ribosomes are bound to the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum, others float freely in the cytoplasm. Now, endomembrane system. This is most of the rest of what we're going to talk about today. It is a system that does many things. It divides the cell into compartments. It is involved in the synthesis of proteins. That would be as a result of those ribosomes I just talked about being bound to the endoplasmic reticulum. It is part of the protein transport system. And it works in lipid metabolism and movement. Now, I want you to realize that structurally, all of the organelles of the endomembrane system only have got one membrane around them. I just talked about the nucleus. It had a double membrane around it. Any of the organelles we're going to talk about for the rest of this video, they are surrounded by one single membrane. That membrane is a phospholipid bilayer, but do know they just have one membrane surrounding them. And almost forgot to mention, and this is important for your life, the endomembrane system works to detoxify any poisons that may end up in your body. So let's talk about some individual organelles. First one is the nuclear envelope. We talked about that just a second ago. 
We've got the endoplasmic reticulum. It comes in the smooth and rough varieties. We have got the Golgi apparatus, it looks like a stack of pancakes. We have got lysosomes, and we have got vesicles and vacuoles. And finally, the plasma membrane, which will get its own video in a couple of days. Now, let's go through these guys individually. Forgive me for the loud now. First one to talk about is the endoplasmic reticulum. It is the highway of the cell. The reason it is called that is because things that are sent out from the nucleus or other parts of the cell travel through that series of passages you see winding away from there. You'll also notice that closer to the nucleus you've got your rough ER. You can see it studded with ribosomes there. And then outside of that you've got your smooth ER. Each one has its own specific type of function or its own specific set of functions that it is responsible for. Do note that it is also a single membrane layer thick and here's a picture of an actual micrograph of the endoplasmic reticulum it's not often that we see it in micrograph form you usually see it as one of those nice little cartoony diagrams but right here you can see all of the lines and compartments of the rough ER you can see right here how it is continuous with our nuclear membrane and then out here you can see all of these kind of tube-shaped pieces that are more open, that would be your smooth ER. And it serves to divide the inside of the cell into a bunch of different compartments. So smooth ER, here are the major things that it takes care of. It synthesizes lipids. So it's responsible for making a lot of the lipids that our body uses. And some of those lipids might be used to turn into hormones. Others might be turned into steroids. Some might become part of cell membranes. It is the manufacturer of lipids. Now, structure function. I want you to remember that parts of the body that are responsible for manufacturing lipids are going to have proportionally more smooth ER than other cells that may not necessarily make so many lipids. They also work in the metabolism of carbs, and big one, they de the smooth ER detoxifies drugs and poison. So something like your liver that is responsible for filtering a lot of your blood is going to have a high proportion of smooth ER because it does a lot of detoxifying. The other thing that it does is it stores calcium ions. Calcium ions are responsible for nerves firing and muscles contracting and part of the components of your bones. They are used in nerve signaling. So pretty important that the smooth ER holds onto those calcium ions for us. And the last thing I want you to know or that I want to talk about for a second is drug tolerance and hormones. Hormones I talked about. Cells that have got a lot of smooth ER are generally involved in synthesizing the lipids that turn into hormones. But drug tolerance, there are a bunch of drugs that cause cells to produce more smooth ER. If a cell produces more smooth ER, that means it is able to detoxify more drugs. If it's able to detoxify more drugs, that means that you become resistant to those drugs. So it's kind of like law of diminishing returns, where you need more drug to get higher, to get drunk each time, because those drugs are causing your body to manufacture more cells that have got a lot of smooth ER in them, which means that it can detoxify your blood more quickly. Now let's talk about the rough ER. This is the one that is generally more known to people. Um, its big role is making secretory proteins. So that just means proteins that are going to probably be exported out of the cell and those are known as or a lot of those are known as glycoproteins because they've got a little carbohydrate flag on them that identifies what type of carbohydrate they are and where they're supposed to go it's kind of like a little shipping tag and they also manufacture transport vesicles that take these proteins that are being manufactured where they need to go now it is called rough ER because it has got ribosomes stuck to its surface all the way around those ribosomes, as they make proteins, the proteins get fed into the inside of the rough ER where they can be read, that glycoprotein tag can be read, and they can be sent to where they need to go. And the rough ER is also responsible for membrane growth. So as the membrane of the cell needs to grow, this rough ER will make vesicles that will travel to the membrane, become part of the membrane, and kind of unfold and make the cell larger. Now let's talk about the Golgi apparatus, our resident stack of pancakes. It is known as the FedEx of the cell. Up there on the top, you've got the traditional cartoon version of it. Down on the bottom, you can see those flat little black lines. 
that is the Golgi apparatus in, I guess you would say, micrograph form. And like I already said, it is known as the FedEx of the cell. We'll talk about why that is now. So inside of the cell, you've got the Golgi apparatus, and its major jobs are receiving, modifying, and shipping proteins. It's got two faces on it. It's got the cis side. The cis side generally faces the rough ER and receives proteins that are coming off of the rough ER. So the rough ER will have a protein made inside of it. That protein will get packaged up into a nice little vesicle that will leave like a little spaceship, travel over to the Golgi. When it fuses from the Golgi, that protein gets put into the Golgi where it will be modified. It could be changed to a different type of polypeptide. It could get some glyco tagging put onto it, or it could just be rearranged as far as shape is concerned. Whenever the Golgi is done modifying it, it will send it out of the trans phase in another little vesicle that's going to bud off and take that protein to wherever it needs to be. Now, I kind of think of it as almost like a corrupt FedEx because it receives your package, it opens it up, messes around with what's inside, and then packages it back up and sends it away. That's what the Golgi does. It gets a protein, it opens up that vesicle, it messes with the protein that's inside, then it packages it back out and sends it off to where it's supposed to be hopefully in a working format. Next, we've got lysosomes. Now, lysosomes are often known as suicide sacs because they are full of hydrolytic enzymes. These guys are just like balls of, well, no, you could actually think of them as like a little ticking time bomb where they are responsible for digesting many things. It could be digesting food. It could be digesting broken cell parts. It could be, in some cases, responsible for kind of self-destructing a whole cell. Structurally speaking, you can see there, their outside is a lipid bilayer membrane, single membrane, and then inside they're full of hydrolytic enzymes. Now, if you remember back to our discussion of macromolecules, hydrolysis is the process of, that breaks down macromolecules. These things are full of the enzymes that can do that. And our last organelle for the day are vacuoles. There are three types, and they've each got different functions. Food vacuoles, are just like little storage trunks. They hold on to food molecules for the cell until a lysosome fuses with them and digests that food that's inside. There are contractile vacuoles. Now I'm gonna show you something here real quick. This little guy off on the side is a little paramecium. You can see on this guy, he's got all of these little things that look like craters on the moon. Because he lives in fresh water, and as a result of osmosis, water is always osmosing into his poor little body, which means that he needs a way to get rid of it or he'll explode like a water balloon. So all of those little vacuoles are continually pumping to expel excess water. Now we'll talk about why that happens more in a later on video this week, but know that contractile vacuoles are in charge of getting rid of water. And finally, you've got central vacuoles. If you think back to our last uh, video, I talked about how Plant cells are very different from animal cells, and one of the reasons is that they've got a big central vacuole that holds water. That's what I'm talking about. This central vacuole noted here is the vacuole in plants that holds water, and the water inside that vacuole causes the vacuole to swell and push out against the cell wall of the plant cell, giving it strength and helping it to stand upright. So I know that is a lot that we went through today. I hope you stuck with me. If you didn't, go back and rewind. I'll look forward to seeing you next time on the Lab 207 webcast. Thanks for hanging out with us.